Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. All right, uh, we'll hear the case of United States uh, versus McCoy. I see counsel are present and uh, uh, we have Judge Agee uh, in full view and uh, uh, Judge Traxler is on by telephone from his location. And uh, we'll begin by hearing from you, Mr. Ashton. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, I represent Antonio McCoy. He was convicted of a drug conspiracy case, continuing criminal enterprise, uh, 60 month consecutive sentence for a firearm and uh, a number of other concurrent drug sentences. Uh, probation seemed to apply just about every enhancement they could and the judge uh, went along with it and assigned maximum sentences on every count. I was not trial counsel. I inherited it for the sentencing and for appeal. And uh, while I don't think anyone condones Mr. McCoy's drug activity, it's our position that he has unreasonably long sentence. I think we've lost counsel. Can't hear me? No, I couldn't now hear we you. Now Yeah. Did I start again? Yep, you're okay now. Okay. Your machine froze up. All right, we did not notice that, but uh, yeah. anyway, I don't know how far I got, but anyway, uh, what we're trying to get is a uh, either a, a new sentencing hearing or a new trial because it's our position that uh, Mr. McCoy's sentence is unreasonably long. Uh, I'd like to address first the uh, CCE special verdict form issue. Uh, it was not raised at trial by counsel, so I assign that as plain error. Can you hear me now? I couldn't hear you. Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, and it's our position that this is a type of case and the, that the jury must unanimously agree on which three specific violations make up the series of violations and there ought to be some type of special verdict form like we have in the drug cases on amounts, uh, firearm cases on brandishing and uh, uh, discharging uh, bank robbery cases and things of that. Well, nature. let me ask you, uh, it, it clearly would have been uh, nicer to have that information, although we may have it from the fact that the jury uh, convicted on other counts. But setting that aside, um, is there any rule that a special verdict form is mandatory? Uh, is it, in other words, is it error uh, to have submitted a general verdict? Um, we cited Apprendi in our brief. Uh, and I think if it's something that the jury has to make a factual determination as if there's a greater sentence or something of that nature, that uh, there should be a special verdict form. And in this particular case, there is a, uh, it goes up to a 20 year, I believe a mandatory minimum sentence and the seriousness of the CCE charge as it relates to the conspiracy being above that conspiracy being a lesser included offense uh, a special verdict form should be required, certainly as to. Well, do, do you have a do you have a case that provides that the you know most of the cases I think all the cases I've read simply require the <clears throat> district court to instruct the jury as it was instructed here that it must be unanimous as to the three uh, predicate crimes, and I, I haven't seen a case yet in this area where it's been found to be an abuse of discretion or error uh, to have um, required uh, the special verdict form. I mean, do you have a case that has required it and said it was error otherwise? Not a specific case. Now, the Brown case, of course, dealt with, uh, I believe, drugs and money laundering and a firearm, as did the case here, and so, the Brown case is the one that I rely on with the Fourth Circuit. 
and it did say that it was uh, subject to harmless error review. And the Brown case found it was not harmless because they could not tell uh, which particular cases the jury relied on. Now, I know in this case, Mr. McCoy was convicted of several other drug offenses, but I would say out of an abundance of caution, there ought to be a special verdict form as to which those were to make sure there was a unanimous agreement on each of those. Well, the Supreme Court in Richardson in this uh, CCC charge area only required that the jury unanimously agree there was no requirement of a special verdict form. It might be prudent in some circumstances, but um, uh, uh, there doesn't seem to be any direction from the Supreme Court that would require it. Well, I, I agree with that. I think we may need some more direction, but what I, I think the argument here is that they're looking at Brown and seeing it had the same type of charges uh, and uh, a new, new trial was uh, warranted that uh, there's a possibility here. I think something as serious as this ought to have a special verdict for him. And I also have a I guess the motion to this uh, rule 29 motion for judgment of acquittal is also based just basically on the CCE charge. Uh, I think there was sufficient evidence to go to the jury on the others. Uh, but we would uh, argue on that that the C continuing criminal enterprise should have been dismissed for insufficient of the evidence. And basically the, the prong that I was <clears throat> argued there had to do with the leadership role and the insufficiency of the, of the evidence on the on the leadership role under sales and slave. And uh, I, I tried to limit it, but if uh, it's certainly our position that there was no uh, drug trafficking organization or leadership role, I think the trial attorney referred, referred to it as a just basically loose loose organization, a bunch of guys from Garland that were out buying and selling drugs, which is very similar to Slade, who was actually here in Craven County, where, where I live, mid-level drug dealer, uh, buying, selling drugs. And so those are the two issues on the CCE uh, case. I would submit there's one, there's really only one trial evidentiary issue that we did raise on the appeal and I would argue to the court it is quite significant is the uh, what I term the abortion issue. The uh, trial judge let a lot of irrelevant and prejudicial evidence in about Mr. McCoy's desire for his girlfriend Andrea Kia Parker to uh, get an abortion. Uh, trial counsel well, it was a little, the evidence, wasn't the evidence a little more fulsome? I mean, the evidence was uh, Mr. McCoy's role in her decision and his insisting that she have the abortion, his going to the abortion center, wanting to be in there to witness it. And uh, 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 it seems to me this is the type of control that we have uh, associated in the past with godfather type of uh, cases uh, uh, where uh, you have an enterprise and somebody's in control of almost everything. Uh, I think it's relevant to that extent. And uh, uh, you didn't make a uh, prejudice uh, uh, argument in the district court. And uh, I'm not sure how far that would have gotten. But uh, it seems to me um, the district court admitted it for uh, relevance to show uh, McCoy's control over the participants. and. Uh, 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 why isn't that uh, 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 a discretionary decision that, that the court could have made? Well, I would submit it was actually a, a, a wrong decision. I believe this was just a, well, a boyfriend girlfriend thing. Obviously, uh, Ms. Parker was in love with Mr. McCoy. Uh, it was a personal thing. And uh, as far as control goes, she did not have it. She uh, went to have it but made made her own mind up not to didn't tell him and the judge let in all the facts about that and then uh on redirect after uh 
an objection to that as well, that in fact that uh, he then uh, called her names and said she deserved this, that, and the other, and just uh, went went on and on. And this is a very, I would submit, it's very prejudicial. And uh, I, I would also submit that uh, the, the uh, trial counsel did not need to make a second objection uh, just uh, to the prejudice fact because the judge was certainly put on notice that he was objecting to this type of evidence and I thought the objection was based on relevance well that's what he said uh, the first time but I, I was I would submit to rule 403 just follows uh, you have to first see if the evidence is prejudicial and then second uh, I mean first see if it's irrelevant if it's irrelevant is it prejudicial and it's it's sort of subsumed in 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 that uh, as, as we go forward. And, then, and when the judge just denied it, uh, a lot of trial counsel don't want to keep objecting to everything. And it went on and on. When it went back, it, uh, it, uh, the redirect examination, he objected again. And I would certainly submit that was sufficient. Uh, and the error was, if it is a plain error standard for that part of it, I would submit it. It was still plain. It was certainly not harmless. It was very, very prejudicial, and it's abortion is a hot issue all over. It's uh, political. People have strong opinions on both sides, and you get a jury in Eastern North Carolina trying to decide a case with drugs, and to just go off on that tangent uh, twice with Miss Parker, we would submit was uh, very, very prejudicial and enough so that it would entitle Mr. McCoy to a new trial. Now, some of the other uh, sentencing issues I've talked about, I think the leadership role and livelihood are sort of subsumed in the, uh, in the criminal enterprise arguments that we made on leadership role. I wasn't gonna address those. Also, we have the objections to relevant conduct and violence and the problem I have with that and I think most trial counsels do is the fact that the probation and then the judges can go way outside the actual evidence that came in at trial. Uh, I know the case law is not real supportive of defendants on that but in the grand scheme of things in this case uh, they brought in a lot of uh, relevant conduct all the way, going all the way back to 2007. Uh, some violence uh, conduct that went way preceded that. Nothing about violence at the trial. The only firearm uh, count and charge had to do with the agents setting up the confidential informant to see if they could buy a gun for Mr. Uh, McCoy. And I think the agent testified he never saw Mr. McCoy with any type of weapon or firearm at any on any of the other occasions uh, and so it's, it's our position that you just have to look at that in the grand scheme of things as far as obstruction of justice i know you we tried to get you some better pages to look at on those letters and uh, and of course the 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 phone call and again there were no threats there were no promises there were no harsh words everything we contend was supposition that mr uh, mccoy maybe meant that ms uh, parker not testify but uh, the agent himself testified there's nothing in the letters or the phone calls uh, any direction to uh, ms parker or her mother for him not to testify ms uh, <clears throat> parker, <coughs> parker she, several times she loved the defendant she just was I guess head over heels about him. She, he never put her in harm's way. There were never any threats, never any force uh, to do anything. And if you look at those letters and the timeline uh, of the phone call, the phone call was in November of 2017. The trial here didn't start till May of 2018. Uh, one of the letters was dated in February of 2017. Uh, the other didn't have a date on it. I assume about the same time, and the postmarks were in 
August and September of 2017. So the timeliness, I would submit if these things had any inclination to be interpreted as a, uh, as a threat or a promise, if they come in uh, April, March or April, you know, right before the trial or something, I would submit that, that there might be sufficient evidence of that. But uh, in this particular case, there should not have been an instruction of justice enhancement. And finally, as I alluded to uh, when I was opening, uh, both the departure motions and variance motions were, were denied. And under uh, Gaul there, we, the standard reviews of reasonableness applying an abuse of discretion standard. I understand that's a, a high burden, but this sentence was uh, certainly more than necessary to uh, punish the crime as it was intended. And I'm over my time right now, I'll reserve the rest of it for rebuttal. All right. Th yeah, you have, you have some rebuttal time. All right, uh, uh, Mr. Bragdon. Good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is David Bragdon and I represent the United States. I, I do have a few things to say on some of the issues raised by, by Mr. Ashton, but given that there's a lot of issues, I did want to just open at the beginning and see if there were any particular questions the court would like me to focus on. Um, With this bill tracks, I have a question about the abortion testimony. Yes. It's my understanding from your brief that you said it was relevant because it went to the defendant's control and direction of Ms. Parker, but isn't it uh, the testimony that she didn't do what he said, that he, she didn't get the abortion? Yeah, yes, Your Honor, it is It is the testimony that she did not get the abortion. And, and so I think the control would be here that she didn't get the abortion but she did go with him to the clinic and she hid the fact that she didn't get the abortion. And so she walked out the back door, I believe the testimony says, without ever telling him that she had not gotten the abortion. And her, his control is, is so complete that he didn't actually find out that she was still pregnant until after her arrest, when she's in jail and, and her mother goes to him and says, you know, this is a problem. She's in jail. She's pregnant. And so th that that I think is the control. And the thing I would add well, to that, does a, what does what does a abortion have to do with the fact she hid she was pregnant? Well, I mean, I guess what I would say is he he wanted her to have an abortion and she wanted him to think she did. You know, he controlled her such that she went along with it it was sort of a passive aggressive no he she didn't actually have the abortion but she wasn't willing to directly oppose him and i did want to add just something to the relevance of this line of testimony in general you know for the for this charge we have to to prove management or supervision of these five people and for most of those people he managed or supervised them through the payment of money. They were they were like employees to him. But for her, he controlled her through the relationship. And he, in fact, in, in Joint Appendix 1083, he tells her that if, he, if she wants to be around, she needs to be an asset to him. That's, that's how much of control there was. And she testifies also that uh, you know, she sold drugs for him because she wanted to be around him. And so, uh, you know, she was helping him count money, selling drugs. She unwittingly took this trip to Charlotte to pick up five kilos of cocaine, obeying pretty much every command along the way. And all that, you know, while she's four months pregnant. And so when she... When, Ms., when she testified about her pregnancy, the, the only question that defense counsel objected to was how, she, how he reacted when he found out she was pregnant. And I would say her reaction is relevant because the pregnancy impacts any relationship. A pregnancy impacts any relationship and the relationship was the source of his control. The, to, to that, I would also add that uh, there, 
we, we cited some cases in our 28J letter that talks about the, the relevance of testimony to show uh, a witness or a, a conspirator's state of mind. And here, I think that the fact that she's desiring to please him, that this relationship is important to her, she's hiding the fact that he's, he's pregnant, all go to show her state of mind. I think it's very difficult in a case like this to sort of surgically remove the aspects of the personal relationship from the drug selling when the relationship is the basis for that. So whether or not we um, determine that the evidence on the abortion was relevant, what if we determine it was nonetheless prejudicial? What happens in that circumstance? Well, Your Honor, uh, I think if it's if the question is whether or not it's prejudicial, then we are on plain air review, uh, both because they didn't object at all to a lot of the line of testimony, and also <laughs> because they never made a prejudice objection. And we cited both an, an unpublished case in this circuit, as well as there's a number of published cases in other circuits that say prejudice objection is is a separate objection. And here, when we get to the third prong of plain error review, look at would it have affected the outcome of the trial, Judge Dever says in, at sentencing that he describes it as a tsunami of evidence that came in against the defendant. He says literally a tsunami rolling in. And so I think the evidence was very strong. It was overwhelming. And so, um, and the other thing I would say about prejudice is this was not incredibly emotional testimony. Uh, first of all, if you look at the testimony, she doesn't talk about the impact on it on her. She doesn't talk about how hard it was on her. She just generally states the facts. It's about five pages of testimony when we consider about over 1,300 pages of, of trial transcripts. So it's a, it's a very small portion of it. There was um, only one reference it to it in closing arguments. It was just kind of a blip on the radar there as well. And and there the, uh, the attorney for the government just used referenced it to say, wasn't it obvious she was telling the truth when she talked about this? He used it as a way of supporting her credibility. And, and, and further, to the extent abortion is controversial, um, it, it is, um, it is controversial, but she didn't actually have the abortion. And so I, I think that's that's relevant to you. The other thing I would note is um, we did cite the, in our 28 J letter, we cited the case of the United States versus Rice, where which is an Eighth Circuit case where uh, even the court found that even irrelevant admission of uh, testimony about a girl, the defendant's girlfriend having an abortion did require reversal. And so I, I think if there'd been a prejudice objection, the court would have considered that issue. He might have decided to give a limiting instruction. There could have been a lot of actions he might have decided in the midst of that because no prejudice objection was raised. Nothing could be done about that. And, um, and the, in terms of how prejudicial it was, the attorneys in the courtroom were really the people in the best position to know if this was prejudicial. And one would think that if it was really prejudicial, the defense attorney would have been jumping up and down, objecting to multiple questions, you know, asking for a, a bench bar with the court, possibly even filing a motion to eliminate. And, and none of those actions were taken. Uh, I'm going to move um, to, I think, uh, just the sentencing issues if there's not other questions related to that portion of the testimony. Just to briefly address um, sentencing, I wanted to, um, I wanted to note uh, that the court in Joint Appendix 1630 to 31 does find an alternative variant sentence. And so I think regardless of the guidelines issues, as we noted in the brief, the lowest possible guideline range this defendant could have had 
been 360 months to life. If if the defendant wins on every single sentencing objection, he's still a career offender and he would still have 360 to life. A life guideline sentence would still be within the guideline range, and the court found that even if it miscalculated the guideline range, it still imposed life. Um, the the second thing I'll note is uh, just that on both the violence and on the drug weight, uh, this court has said that if a party is objecting to information in the pre-sentence report, it has an affirmative duty to show that the information is incorrect. And the defendant below did not make uh, any specific arguments about what was wrong about the drug weight and the PSR or the violent crimes in the PSR. So I think in terms of that, the guidelines were accurate, the court did accurately impose them, but even if it didn't, um, it was an alternative variant sentence. And in terms of substantive reasonableness, uh, in this case, um, the court, you know, one of the one of the confidential informants talks about the defendant's own words where he says that he was a drug dealer his whole life. In the letters to and Andrikia Parker, he's talking about still having five bricks of of cocaine and a, a million dollars and the desire to, to start up immediately after being released from prison. And, and there's no indication, well, this is certainly the longest sentence the court could impose. There's no indication that it was unreasonable that in the large scale drug trafficking organization we have. The, uh, if, if there's no further questions from the court, uh, we'll, we'll rest on our brief on the other issues, and I would ask the, this court to. Thank you, Mr. Bragdon. Mr. Ashton? Thank you, Your Honor. Am I on? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if, I, if I could address first the, uh, going back to the abortion issue and, and control, problem is with the abortion evidence is highly inflammatory, very prejudicial, it's a hot button issue, it was then, it still is, uh, and they didn't need that, it's totally unnecessary to show her involvement with Mr. McCoy. She was uh, the girlfriend, but she also was a runner for him, she picked up money for him and stuff like that, she was certainly one of, one of five people. And they, this other evidence was totally unnecessary and we would submit inflammatory. And especially when it, it came up both times. Uh, again, I do not think it ought to be under a plain error standard, but even if it is, <clears throat> I would certainly submit it was, it was uh, plain and was more than harmless error under all the facts and circumstances. The other point on that, is I know Judge Dever, and he says this in several cases, a tsunami of evidence against the person, but you got to remember, most all the witnesses had bad criminal records. There were other drug dealers, they were confidential informants trying to get a deal. Uh, Ms. Parker was someone with a reputable history prior to this and did not have a record. And to get into all that extraneous information with her, I would a bit was very very prejudicial and if there was a if they could have negated the testimony of these other people uh, the co-defendants and confidential informants that testified they could not negate Ms. Uh, Parker's testimony and the prejudice was not that she didn't have the abortion the president pre the uh, prejudice is that Mr. McCoy wanted her to have one and took her to get one and that all that evidence came came in. Uh, as far as the uh, the total sentence and as it's incurred, uh, as we said before, I believe the sentence is greater than necessary to uh, uh, satisfy the sentencing factors under section 3553A. Um, we certainly feel a term of years could do that. He actually got 
seven 480 month or 40 year terms uh, concurrent and three 30, two 30 year terms and a 20 year term. That's more than enough. But, and the judge seemed to have <clears throat> totally given up on Mr. McCoy. And I know he's a young man. He may have had an attitude at some time, but he had a lot of potential. He was a high school graduate. He was a basketball star. He had, uh, he was somewhat charismatic, uh, had intelligence. And if you throw the book at him and give him a life sentence, there's, there's, there's no hope. And I would submit that Mr. McCoy has some hope for uh, rehabilitation down the road. The Pepper case, I believe, is held for nearly 10 years now that uh, uh, post-sentencing rehabilitation uh, can be a good factor. Judge Dever made it pretty clear that no matter what, he was giving Mr. McCoy every day that he could. He said twice he was going to incapacitate him, that he would never get out, that he'd be in for the rest of his natural life, and that he suggested he be at a maximum security prison. Uh, and I would submit that this was just over the top on something of this particular nature, and that the term of years, it, it deleted any chance of Mr. Uh, McCoy getting out at any time in, in, the, in the future. And in the grand scheme of things, uh, a sentence of some type of term of years, which would offer some hope or chance of rehabilitation down the road would have been appropriate. And so we also submit that the, the judge should have looked at the variance motion in more detail than he did. I don't know that he actually ever ruled on it, but obviously the sentence showed that he, he didn't. And uh, we would ask for a new trial because of the abortion issue, a special verdict form under CCE, and a new sentencing hearing if appropriate. Thank you for hearing us. Well, thank you, Mr. Ash. Uh, I understand you're court appointed. Is that is that right? I am, Your Honor. Yeah. Well, I want to uh, express our appreciation and recognize that. As you know, we value that enormously. And uh, uh, you have uh, enabled our system to go forward in that respect. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll uh, adjourn court for today. And, uh, 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 and I'll ask... Uh, the judges to uh, will conference uh, the case right after this. Uh, will you please adjourn court? Yes, sir. This honorable court stands adjourned until tomorrow morning. God save the United States and this honorable court. <laughs>